Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to another ChrisMartinson.com podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with John Rubino, publisher of DollarCollapse.com, a popular online hub for news impacting the economy. John is the author of several well-received books foretelling, years in advance, the collapse of the housing market and the decline of the U.S. dollar. Before starting his website, John was a featured columnist with TheStreet.com, uh, individual investor, and a number of other influential financial publications. And uh, his perspective on Wall Street and the currency markets is shaped by his past roles as a euro-dollar trader. So he knows what he's talking about. He was an equity analyst and a junk bond analyst in the 80s. So lots of experience here. And with the dollar recently sliding to what I consider dangerous lows, I've asked John to come with us here and share his thoughts on where it goes from here. Welcome, John. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Oh, my pleasure. To set the stage, let's talk about what led you to write The Coming Collapse of the Dollar and How to Profit from It way back in 2004. I'm sure way before that was a popular thing to do. And I like to think of myself as having been an early warning siren on this same subject. But you and your co-author, James Turk, you were way out in front with this message, much earlier than most, including myself. So uh, how did you see that? What, what dark clouds did you see on the horizon? What, what were you looking at that made you arrive at that conclusion? Dur during the couple of years before that, I had written a book on the, the coming real estate bust. And I went into that piece of research with the idea that, that it was just the real estate market that was really the problem. And, and uh, it would blow up, and then the U.S. economy would go on as before. And, but, but as I dug into the research, I realized that we really had systemic problems. You know, things were much more serious than just home prices getting a little out of hand and, and mortgage money getting too easy, and that we were across the board taking on massive amounts of debt, which would inevitably lead us to do something extreme. Either, either we'd have to collapse under all that debt and have a 1930s-style depression, or we would inflate our way out of it, destroy the currency in order to pay back the debt in cheaper dollars, and have some kind of a um, inflationary episode. And I had known James Turk, the, the founder of Gold Money, uh, because we'd done a, a couple of articles together. I interviewed him and, and found him to be, you know, brilliant and uh, and also a nice guy. So I approached him and said, hey, you know, you want to write a book on gold and the dollar and stuff like that? And he said, oh, I would love to, but I don't have the time to do it. And uh, I said, well, you know, together we could do it. And, and he liked the idea, so we worked out a deal. And, and um, so a, a lot of the writing is mine. A lot of the really deep ideas in that book are his, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, so we spent the next year basically uh, putting that book together. And the, the timing was a little bit early, but mm -hmm. um, only by about a year or so, because it came out in, in 2004, and the dollar went up for the year after that. <laughs> and uh, so had it come out a year later, it would have been perfect. But even so, you know, gold was like $400 an ounce at the time, and silver was 4 or $5 an ounce. And so in the ensuing um, six or seven years, um, most of the um, – the ideas in the book have come true. You know, we have been inflating away the dollar in order to uh, to pay off our debts, and that has been causing precious metals to go up, which is to say that precious metals have held their value while the dollar's been going down. And so you get um, much higher gold and silver prices today and a, a much weaker dollar, and a process that has really just begun. You know, the, the U.S. has done nothing to manage its finances in the meantime. Things have actually gotten a lot worse. And we've clearly made the decision to try to inflate our way out of all of our debt. So um, going forward, I know there, there are a lot of other things going wrong in the world, but uh, just looking at the U.S. finances would be enough to, uh, to lead you to say that uh, the, the world was headed for some kind of a catastrophe. Because when, when the biggest economy that is the issuer of the world's reserve currency is doing stupid things on this scale and clearly trying to destroy its own currency, you get a global crisis out there somewhere. And that, that's really what we're looking at now. Yeah, you know, uh, if, you'd, if you'd told me, John, if you said, Chris, uh, this is five years ago, he said, Chris, um, we're going to get to a point where uh, U.S. Treasuries are going to be at about the 3.4% range, and the U.S. government's going to be running its third consecutive multi-trillion dollar fiscal deficit. Actually, it's going to be $1.6 trillion. Um, and... Uh, uh, and, and the world hasn't sort of burst into economic flames. I, I would have said that's, that's insane. It's not possible. Uh, it, yeah. 
It, I mean, is this is any of this surprising to you? I mean, we, you saw the structural imbalances, you see the debt, and then you see the responses, and here we are. Uh, what's surprising to you in this story, and, and what, what isn't? Well, the, the general shape of, um, of the world right now is pretty much what seemed reasonable to happen at the time. Um, you know, in, in other words, I thought we'd get into a mess sort of like this, but the numbers are still shocking. You know, the trillion-dollar deficits. That I, I would have kind of agreed with you back then that it was almost physically impossible, you know, that we would be violating laws of physics mm-hmm. to have treasury bond yield where they are now and a deficit where it is now. That didn't seem possible. Yeah. And what is, what's happened, of course, is that we've got the government intervening in the bond market to keep rates low by buying massive amounts of bonds with newly printed money or newly created money. Printing is uh, not how they do it anymore. But uh, um, this is a trend, or this is a situation that's really unsustainable because you've got massive amounts of new dollars flowing into the system in order to keep interest rates low, but all that, the supply of new dollars pushes the value of the dollar down, which inevitably will push up interest rates because who wants to own a 30-year treasury bond yielding 4.5% when the dollar is being debased by more than four and a half percent. You get a negative long-term yield in an investment like that. And so the, the people who are buying treasury bonds right now are, are not doing it with an investment return in mind. They're doing it with other objectives. You know, China has been accumulating U.S. bonds for years because they want to keep U.S. interest rates low, so we will borrow money in order to buy their stuff. Non-economic participants, is that what we call them? Yeah, basically. Well, it's, it's vendor financing. It's like when Cisco lends money to some companies so they'll, they'll buy Cisco's networking gear, all right? It's exa- exactly the same thing. And that works until the company you're lending the money to goes bankrupt, and then you're stuck with that debt. And China's kind of looking at something like that right now because basically the, um, the money they're lending us is going to have to be written off at some point. And they're starting to figure that out now. So the reason this is unsustainable is that all the guys who are buying treasuries out there, they have more than they want, and they're worried about it. They're trying to figure out how to get out of their treasury positions. And, and China especially has uh, has been making a lot of noises about uh, shifting out of their dollars and into other currencies and into real assets. So they're, in the next few years, going to be on a global buying binge of oil wells and gold wells and farmland around the world. And they're going to do that by selling their treasury bonds and then taking the uh, the resulting dollars and spending them on real assets. And they've been making those noises for a while, too. Yeah, well, they, they have been. And in the meantime, their balances of dollar-denominated assets keep growing, yeah. up to like $3 trillion. Right. And there's a limit to that. See, the, the problem with bubbles is that they blow right through your... your rationally arrived at limits and keep on going before they burst. Mm-hmm. And the dollar bubble is no different. I mean, the, the imbalances that we see now would have seemed, like you said, impossible to a rational analyst of five or ten years ago. And yet, here they are, and here they go. And at some point, they blow up, because something that can't keep going doesn't keep going. Mm-hmm. Eventually, it, uh, it, it stops under its own weight or some external shock forces it to stop or whatever. And the only question now is, at what point do we hit a wall? You know, when, when does the dollar die? Or when does the U.S. collapse under the weight of all its debt and head back into a 1930s-style depression? And, you know, three years ago, I would have said, we're right there. And I still feel that way. I feel like um, something could happen at any point to send us over the cliff. And it, there, there's no telling what that is. And, you know, I, I recognize intellectually that it might not be for a while yet. But it sure feels like it could happen sometime soon, just because these imbalances are unbelievable. Nobody in the in their rational right mind would buy U.S. stocks or buy U.S. dollars or hold U.S. Treasury bonds under these circumstances. And yet, a lot of the people in the world are doing that. Well, the only reason I can think I could put stocks into the OK balance is that if S and P five hundred forty percent of their profits come from overseas, assuming those companies haven't hedged. A falling dollar actually looks really good um, to their dollar-based profit lines. It might still not look good if you're a European investor and you put euros in and, you know, there's a decent return on the S&P, but it debases because the dollar is going down, then you're back at square one if you're lucky. Um, but from, from a U.S. perspective, I could see that, but, but that's a real stretch. I mean, there we're speculating on the degree to which the dollar is going to fall and thereby boost the profits of the stocks we're holding. That's not investing. That's something else. No. No, it's uh, well, it's, it's speculating, and then I think investors don't see it that way because they're looking at corporate earnings and saying, "Well, you know, the, this this company's earnings went up by thirty percent this year, therefore, uh, you know, we'll, we'll hop on board because it's clearly growing." But 
Um, at the same time this is happening, with the dollar falling, which clearly does in the short run help corporate earnings, you get a margin squeeze because uh, a falling dollar sends the cost of raw materials up. You know, you've got oil over $100 a barrel again, and, and virtually every agricultural and most industrial commodities weigh up. And this affects the cost of doing business for most companies. So depending on your industry, um, there, there are a lot of margin squeezes beginning to happen out there. Like if you're a restaurant chain, okay, and, and you know, wheat is up by 40% and tomatoes are up by 70% and everything else is way up, you've got to raise your prices. Or you've got to raise your prices by half as much as your costs are going up and then eat the, uh, the extra costs. And that hurts your earnings. And that, that's happening in a whole range of industries right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's not really apparent yet because it happens with the lag. You know, commodity prices go up and then uh, final goods go up at some point in the future. And it's going to happen, though. And so when we see prices start to go up, that, that has a couple of effects. It causes people to buy fewer things, so consumer spending goes down. And it hurts the profitability of a lot of different industries. So that's what worries me about U.S. stocks is that, uh, yeah, overseas earnings will be going up, but at the same time we'll be seeing a margin squeeze that affects domestic earnings. And, uh, you know, you, you get a lot of cross currents that raises the level of uncertainty and stock market investors don't normally like uncertainty because you're already dealing with kind of a risky asset. You want predictability. And when uncertainty starts to outweigh predictability, then you, you've got a big problem. Right, right. So I, let, let's talk about some of these speculative elements. You know, the Fed's QE programs over the past few years, uh, they, they've created just this flood of liquidity. I mean, it's everywhere, and it's having all sorts of global implications. You know, they, they, you say it's, it's electronic printing, right? They hit a keystroke, and this money goes out. And I, I'm, a, I'm a believer that the Fed has a ton of power because they can do that, and they can hide a lot of their transactions from us. But they're not omnipotent because once they press that button and they release that liquidity into the wild, it goes out and does stuff. And one of the things it's doing is, is uh, driving up everything, stocks, bonds, uh, commodities, everything, right? So, so we have that flood of liquidity. Well, right now, it appears that we're going to have the end of QE2, and we'll, we'll lapse into something I'm going to call QE sort of, which means they're going to take the MBS paper, roll it. But what's that, $17, $18 billion a month, um, where they're currently tossing 100 to $118 billion a month in. So there's going to be a huge withdrawal of liquidity, in essence, in June. Um, w- how does that play out in your mind? What, what impact might that have if that comes to pass? Well, the, the system still needs new liquidity. Uh, you know, we're, we're not a healthy economy. We're, we're grossly over-indebted. <clears throat> and the only reason that there's any growth at all is, uh, well, two reasons. One, they're lying to us about the numbers. And the other is that the government is basically printing money and handing it to people. And you take part of that away, and you would expect to see a corresponding de- decrease in, in the amount of consumer spending and business investment and stuff that's out there. And I think it's completely possible that that's part of the plan, that uh, the, the Fed, because commodities are through the roof right now and inflation is starting to pick up, they don't feel like they can just come out under these circumstances and say, all right, we're going we're gonna to keep pumping money into the system um, at the same level that we were doing during QE2, because that would just send everything through the roof. And then you'd have debilitating levels of inflation, which are counterproductive from the point of view of trying to keep the economy growing. So what they might be hoping for is a correction. In other words, they, they withdraw a little bit. The economy starts to slow down. Some kind of financial market disruption happens, like stocks dropping or, or whatever. And that gives them their, their excuse to come back in with another liquidity program. You know, may, maybe it's QE3, maybe it's some other new thing that they come up with, but they'll find a reason and uh, a method of pumping out new money, uh, because that's really their goal. They, I think they recognize that uh, unless they depreciate the dollar, dramatically from here, we'll, we're, we'll never get out from under the amount of debt that we've taken on. So they know they have to do that, but they have to do it in a way that isn't counterproductive. Um, so that might be giving them a little bit too much credit for foresight, but <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me at all if that's uh, that's one of their contingency plans and that's actually what they're hoping for. Yeah, I, I'm in agreement that uh, the United States faces a fiscal 
emergency that, that can really only be solved, and I'm putting air quotes up around it, that word right now, solved, um, by having a much, much weaker dollar. And, of course, they go out and give lip service to the fact that we want to have a strong dollar, but, but they're, you know, they have to say that. Um, you know, <laughs> if you made a drinking game out of every time the, the you know, Hank Paulson or, or uh, you know, any of those uh, former uh, Treasury secretaries came out and said, I, I, too, support a strong dollar, you know, you'd have a lot of drunk people. Because um, they were always saying it, but it was clear that that's not what they were after. And, in fact, there's no way at a larger structural level that this can be solved through any solved, again, their air quotes, solved through anything other than a weaker dollar. But guess what? Everybody wants a weaker currency in this game. So how, how does that, when, you, when we widen up the, the, the field of view a little bit, how, do you do, how does everybody weaken globally? What does that look like? Well, you, uh, okay, what, what's happening now is we're, we're exporting our inflation to the rest of the world and forcing countries like Brazil and China to endure the pain that we should be enduring. So, you know, Brazil's interest rates are like 12% right now. And China is is doing something new every couple of days to scale back bank lending and, and spending domestically and everything. So they are countries where a big part of the population makes just, you know, a few dollars a day. And, and rising food and energy prices are devastating for these guys. And they don't really control the global price of energy and food, yet they're having to endure the pain of, of slowing their economies down and throwing people out of work and um, and having them have to um, spend more and more of their money on food and energy. So we can keep on borrowing and, and growing, and the government can keep on spending as much as they want to here. And that clearly that's unsustainable, because at some point these countries are going to say, no, we, we want our currencies to depreciate too. You know, we, we want to be able to continue to export to you. And so what we'll end up with is um, some sort of like what happened in the Depression, where everybody was trying to cut the value of their currencies at the same time. And what that leads to, obviously, is global inflation. Instead of just localized inflation, where a few countries are debasing their currencies, you got everybody doing it at once. And that's because the U.S., with the, the world's reserve currency, basically controls this process. And we've chosen to uh, to decrease the value of the dollar dramatically over the next few years. And that's going to force the rest of the world to do the same thing or endure, uh, you know, a rocketing economy and a, or a rocketing currency value and, and a recession, which no elected politician can put up with. So what's out there? Maybe after a, um, a mini recession or some kind of a correction in the next year or two is another round, an even bigger round of global inflation in which basically all the fiat currencies of the world start decreasing in value at an accelerating rate until we basically destroy most of them, you know? At, at some point out there, the, the whole concept of fiat currency, of uh, governments in charge of their own monetary printing presses, is going to be discredited. But it's going to take a lot of pain in the meantime for that to happen because very few people understand the process and um, very few people are willing to give up the benefits of having the government in charge of a printing press. And so it's going to take a lot of pain in order to shift that kind of public sentiment all the way around the world. But it'll happen because uh, there doesn't seem to be a solution that is politically palatable to anybody out there right now. Right. So if I, if I put that together, you're thinking like I am that um, if, if QE2 ends, there's the possibility of a downdraft that then allows the Fed to ride back in again. During that downdraft, near term, short term, we could see um, downdraft in everything, including precious metals and, and everything else out there, all the other commodities, stocks, bonds. But the question then becomes, um, let's widen that out again. Now, now let's talk longer term. Given the direction things are going, given the pressures, given political realities, given how history seems to have worked, uh, what, what is your longer term view then um, of precious metals uh, and you know, particularly silver, gold or anything when we talk about the extraordinary run they've had at the prices they're at right now, but Given the long term, uh, would you advise somebody who does not yet have a core position in precious metals to hold their nose and buy, or should they wait? What, what would they do in this environment? Well, when, when something like silver is up by a thousand percent in a decade, mm -hmm. uh, that just, uh, on principle, <laughs> makes me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you on that. <laughs> and, you, know, you know, long term, be, because the um, the policies of the governments of the world are clearly biased towards pushing the value of their currencies down. You know, that's, that's baked in the cake because we've overspent and we have no choice but to uh, try to get out from under our debt by depreciating our currencies. Long term, that's great for precious metals because they're really the, uh, basically the, the reciprocal of the dollar. You know, if, if the dollar is going to go down, then precious metals will go up because we measure precious metals in dollars. And so over the long run, you know, I think you could easily see $10,000 gold and several hundred dollars silver. And, uh, and, 
that's not saying they got any more valuable in the meantime. It just means that the dollar was um, debased by that amount mm-hmm. in that time. And clearly, that's what we're headed for. Unless we elect, you know, Ron Paul and make him a dictator or something like that, and and all of a sudden we decide to take the pain and endure a a, a massive depression for 10 years to get out from under this debt, then we're probably going to keep on running the printing presses. That's good for gold and silver. Now, in, in the year ahead, you know, it's been such a long, unbroken run, and, uh, you know, the stock market has more than doubled, and gold and silver are way up, and oil has had its run from 30 to 100 and some. And, you know, it feels like these trends are ready for a hiccup, and not just because of the chart, but because a lot of them are um, self-contradictory. You know, when, when oil gets to a certain point, it chokes off consumer spending because we're spending all our money just to get to work, and that doesn't leave anything else for restaurant meals and, and stuff like that. So the economy starts to slow down, and then that impacts the stock market, and you head into a recession. You know, that's, that, that's the normal course of an economy, and we're heading to that point. You know, when commodity prices get too high, they choke, choke off other ac- economic activity. And so it wouldn't be at all a surprise to see a slowdown in the year ahead in reaction to higher commodity prices, which send a lot of risk assets down. And that wouldn't mean that uh, the, the game is over, because that would just energize government policy that's already in place. And so we'd see another round of you know, quantitative easing or something like it, which would send us back into an inflationary spiral. But we'd have a year, you know, or two years, or whatever, when it seems like the deflationist argument is starting to win again. And I don't think we can rule that out because um, I don't know how much higher oil can go at this point without it becoming really debilitating for an energy-intensive economy like the U.S. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So um, uh, as I look at it, you know, here we are. We're talking on, on Friday, April 29th, 2011, and uh, the dollar's pretty much right at 73 last I checked uh, on the USD index. Uh, a lot of traders, including myself, look at the 72, 74 level. It's, it's a critical band of support there. It goes way back. Um, is, you know, in your view, uh, you know, is this a critical moment? I mean, are we going to crack below 72 here, or do we put in the legendary W, V, or V bottom on this thing and bounce, and that's that? Um, but if we do crack 72, if assuming you, know, you could speculate around what would happen there, how fast and how far could the dollar go? Uh, Personally, I see a lot of air under that chart. I don't have a target for it. Um, I'm wondering if you do. That, that's another one of those questions, as with oil. How much further can the dollar drop before it becomes front-page news and a huge problem for the economy? Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think it's clear right now where, where that point is, but uh, historically, it's got to be somewhere around here because uh, this is as low as it's gotten. And in the past, when it got to this point, it caused trouble for so many different parties around the world that um, something happened to reverse out the trend. And because the numbers are so much bigger now, you know, our, our debt is so much higher, and the amount of money the government's printing is, is so much bigger than it used to be, that the corresponding effect on the dollar could be bigger. You know, we could see the, the blow-off top in commodities and the blow-off drop in dollar, in the dollar index um, at some point here, where the dollar just falls through the floor and, and drops five or six more points from here. and uh, Or we could see it bounce off its its long-term resistance level and, you know, the, the trouble begin now and, and something happened to make the dollar go up. You know, I, I don't really have an opinion about that except to say that um, a lot of these trends are reaching the point where they're, they're starting to cause more trouble than the system can bear, and so they've got to be reversed out. And the dollar is one of the big ones. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, once upon a time, uh, way back when, don't want to date myself, but people used to look at the M's and, and follow monetary policy. It was important. And that's all been but been dropped at this point in time. I guess, you know, we're, we're interested in speculating now um, more. But I'm actually hearing more and more people come out with what I consider to be crazy talk, like, like uh, very big uh, people running very big funds who say things like, Fiat currency as a concept is uh, is is uh, getting dicey to me. Uh, the United States system is a Ponzi scheme. I mean, big words, right? Big charges, but I think that that the inherent flaw that exists at the heart of every debt-based money system, of which fiat money is a prime example, is that eventually you just can't continue to compound your debts forever. Uh, sooner or later, you, you you can't do that, and you have to hit the reset button. And I feel like we're close to that. Not close. I don't know. Is it ten years or is it ten minutes from now? But we're in there. 
Um, I honestly don't have insights to when, but you can feel that, that there's just something structurally wrong with the whole system. And to me, widen the lens way up, it's too much debt. And we can't possibly continue to compound the debt at the same rates. The inverse of debt in our system is money, um, with with gold holding this very nice antimatter um, role way off to the side. And, and so I look at from the 70s to 80s to 90s, 2000s, and then to 2010, in each one of those five decades, we at least doubled credit in every one of those decades. In fact, we had six doublings in five decades. So in order to follow that pattern, in order for the next 10 years to look like any one of those decades, we would have to double our credit market debt. Okay, that's from 52 to $104 trillion. Where does that $52 trillion in borrowing come from for the U.S.? Uh, I can't see it anywhere, no matter how, how big the budget deficit. So, so we're into new territory in this story. Something is fundamentally going to change in this next 10 years, which is going to be a decade where we can't double our credit unless we severely debase the dollar. I, I, that's the trap I see in, in this story. Um, so, so if that comes to pass, what does that world look like, though, with, with a dollar spiking down? What, what, what does that feel like to investors, and, and what, what would individual investors do in that circumstance? So, Chris, you, you are exactly right. Everything comes back to the dollar here. If, um, if we intend to try to double the debt in the system again, after having done, doubled it already for six straight decades, then um, we're going to have to do it by basically just flooding the system with dollars. You know, we won't be able to get anybody else in the world to buy all of our debt, so we're going to have to buy it ourselves. The Fed will just have to increase its balance sheet with, by buying treasury bonds with newly printed money. And so it comes down to the value of the dollar. They can keep on doing this, as they have been doing it, as long as the rest of the world is willing to accept dollars in return for real stuff. But as soon as the rest of the world figures out that the dollar is being destroyed and decides that they don't want to accept dollars for, for real stuff anymore, the price of everything goes through the roof and people totally lose faith in the dollar and the system falls apart and the game is over. And the question is, where is that? So if, if the dollar right now, which is already at multi-year lows, hits an air pocket and really plunges, then it becomes front page news and the debate becomes, is the dollar over? And by implication, is the concept of fiat currencies valid, or should we have never tried this experiment? That's going to be a fascinating discussion, and it's going to be absolutely devastating for the U.S. economy, because if nobody will take dollars, then we have to live within our means. And that means we have to cut, what, 20% of GDP out of the economy immediately. And, uh, you know, as fun as that would be to watch, it's going to be painful for a lot of people. And, uh, you know, at some point, the numbers don't lie. As, As you said, you can't increase something exponentially forever and we've reached the point of the last doubling so we're, we're looking at that you know something as crazy as that sounds we're looking at something very much like that sometime in the next decade and maybe sometime in the, the year ahead so it leads to the question then is collapse inevitable and is this just how fiat currencies end um, but maybe not you know can you see is there is there something that we could start doing today you mentioned maybe if, if ron paul became um, dictator for life or something and was allowed to just get out his magic red pen and go go to town on the budgets um that you, you mentioned that that might be something that that could be done but what if anything could put us on more sound footing uh, f- to build for a, a prosperous future well we're, we're at the point right right now where we've borrowed so much money that we really only have two choices one is to liquidate this debt via default and and just have a 1930s style depression which would be bigger than the 1930s and more painful because we've taken on correspondingly a lot more debt and just spend 10 years in which companies go bankrupt people get thrown out of work governments have to lay off two-thirds of their firemen and and policemen and teachers and um, come out at a point where the productive side of the economy is able to carry the remaining debt 10 years of extreme pain in which the people in charge get voted out of office five different times. And so because of that, it's, it's not something that any politician is going to willingly accept. So the only thing left for these guys, if they want to keep their job, is to try to keep the game going. And so, so no, to answer your question, I don't think there's a pain, pain-free solution. We, we've taken on all this money or all this debt, and we have to get rid of it somehow. So either we have to find a way to carry it, which is going to involve immense pain, or we have to repudiate it, which will be even more painful in the short run. And that's it. <laughs> that's our decade, you know. And, and uh, I think it's really instructive, too, that, that you and I can kid around about making Ron Paul a dictator, because 
that's the kind of thing that, that you see in big financial crises. You see people just throwing up their hands and going, listen, I don't care about my civil rights, you know, just save me from this catastrophe. And, and so you get Hitler or Napoleon or, or any number of other dictators who have come into power during financial crises. And, uh, you know, I hate the idea that um, the U.S. and the baby boomer generation in the U.S. in particular has brought us to this point, but that might be what we see in the future. We're going to demand strong leadership from people and the hell with civil rights because we're, we're so terrified by what we're seeing, everybody around us losing their jobs, and losing their livelihoods, and you know, kids starving and stuff like that, which is the inevitable result of taking on this kind of debt. And so, I think the uh, the decade ahead could be it could be an economic mess for sure, but it could be a political mess too, and that's that's terrifying. I, I have two young sons, and you know, the idea that they're going to grow up in a world like that where. Um, you have political turmoil, and then, which usually leads to, leads to some kind of crazy war that uh, we never would have thought of doing otherwise. And they're going to be at like draft age at that time. And um, so I'm, I'm terrified for that part of our future, and I don't see any real clean alternatives to it. Well, you know, it's it's a um, a personal fear, and I will consider it a personal failing of mine if we go to a resource war with China, uh, and my kids get drafted. I've got three kids who are all getting to that age, and. Uh, and we might do that simply because it's easier for a politician rather than look in the mirror to look across the border and say, there's our problem right there, those guys. Um, you know, and we've had precious little introspection about the fact that we have been living beyond our means. Uh, and in my world, you know, you live beyond your means for a while, you live below your means for a little while, and it all balances out. So long as we're unwilling to do that, uh, we risk just driving and living beyond our means until we hit a wall of some kind. And so... Um, but quickly, I'd like to talk to you about that because my response to that was that I ended up moving to a more rural community where I figured the, the people, the resources, the skill sets that existed here uh, might offer more advantages in a future where, where you know, who knows, the economy might not perform like I expected to. It might fall apart substantially in certain ways or even completely. I don't know. Um, that's what I did. But I, I understand that you moved to a more rural community as well. And, uh, and uh, I'm wondering if, if – it was your research and your analysis that led to that move. Uh, no, it actually wasn't. We're, we're in Idaho, in a, a town of about 20,000 people. And uh, we moved from back east out here basically because I wanted to be in a place where I could ride my bike for two or three hours a day if I wanted to. And there, you know, there are rivers around here, and everybody fishes, and everybody has a boat. And that's the, the lifestyle that I aspire to once I don't have to work as much as I do now. And uh, so... so that was the motivation for the move, but it's turned out to be a great place from the point of view of all the, the stuff that you were talking about. You know, this is, is kind of agricultural out here, so there's tons of food. You know, the, the idea of um, soaring food prices and shortages at the grocery store, that doesn't really scare me because there's farmland all around me, so I assume that we'll be okay in that sense. And everybody has gardens and land, and they raise chickens, and and uh, they hunt. You know, so it's, it's the kind of place where... Um, Resource scarcity isn't the uh, the terror that it would be if you were in downtown Los Angeles or something like that, where there's uh, where you depend on long energy intensive supply lines to get you all the things that you need. And so, for for people in situations like that, the, the future is even scarier than it is for somebody uh, living in a place like where you and I live. And uh, I, I don't really know what advice to give somebody who can't just pick up and move to. Um, an easier, safer place, because most people can't do that, you know, so you're, you're kind of, you're wedded to your city or your town because of your job or your family or whatever, and so you've got to deal with things as they are, and so, yeah, you know, some, some food supplies in the basement would probably be a good thing just from a peace of mind point of view, and maybe um, some foreign real estate or something like that, you know, there's a, there's a concept that, that James Turk has, has been talking about forever called the uh, the last plane account which is uh, back when he was an asian banker um they, they used to set up accounts for people where they would move some money overseas so if things just spun completely out of control and you had to take the last plane out before everything devolved into chaos yes. you you would be able to live your life wherever you went to because because you'd have a, a bank account or some land or whatever in another place and so you wouldn't be destitute and that might be something for um, Americans to start thinking about now. You know, we need to move some money overseas just because when huge financial crises hit, a lot of the time they're accompanied by capital controls where 
uh, governments just decree that nobody's allowed to move money outside the country. And confiscations. In the 1930s, they took away everybody's gold. Gold. You know, they went to your uh, safe deposit box, and if you had gold coins there, they, they took them away. And they made you a, a criminal for refusing to do something like that. And so we might not see that again, but we're liable to see some modern variation of it. And so it's probably wise to have some money beyond the reach of the IRS. And you can do that by setting up, you know, a gold money account or storing some bullion in a Swiss bank or buying uh, Latin American real estate, as long as you choose very wisely, or um, Swiss annuities. There, there's a long list of reasonably time-tested offshore investments that Americans can look at. And I think it makes sense if you've got a little bit of spare capital to be looking into things like that, because um, geographic diversification is always a good idea, but it becomes an even better idea when the place that you live is doing things that have historically led to chaos. And the U.S. is absolutely in that boat right now. Right. Uh, it's uh, had an exorbitant privilege in the world's reserve currency. I, I, it's never the change that scares me that much. It's sort of the pace and the scale of it. And, and so my concern is centered around the idea that we, uh, with everything hardwired and fiber optically connected at this point, change can happen a lot quicker than it used to. You know, they say Rome didn't fall in a day. That's true. But, you know, don't forget they had to send notes by pony. You know, it took time. Um, these days, you know, we watch like just how rapidly like Greece's uh, economic situation has devolved. It's, you know, to me, that's light speed. You know, one month we're okay. Six months later, we're, we're absolutely trolling the bottom of the interest rate barrel here. Uh, that's shocking. And, and so that's the kind of pace of change that I think could be um, really quite disruptive if, 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 if not if, I guess, when. Um, finally, the economic reality of the U.S. Kick, catches up. You know, can't kick the can down the road any further. Interest rates um, sort of leave the grasp of the Federal Reserve and go do what they're going to do. And the Fed has historically been a market follower, not setter. Um, so event someday, it'll, the market will set different rates for us. And boy, everything changes. And it could be really, really fast. Um, and by fast, again, I'm talking, you know, within less than a year. That's fast to me in these sorts of things. Yeah. Absolutely right. I mean, it, you know, it could grind on for a long time, but it could just be one of those instantaneous things where um, something happens. The dollar or interest rates or oil prices or, or something just goes the wrong way uh, too quickly, and everybody panics. And then, then everybody finally grasps reality, and it's game over. And that, that happens with currencies. You know, the Weimar Republic um, hyperinflation that we hear so much about still was just like two years. They, they completely destroyed their currency. In, in the blink of an eye. And uh, the, the same thing could happen to us, not because we cranked up the printing presses beyond what they are now, but because people figured it out and just instantly lost faith in the U.S. dollar. And when something like that happens with, a, with like you said, instantaneous global communications, you have everybody hitting the sell button at the same time in, in one global market and game over. And yeah, we could see that very easily. So uh, it, you know, it could be this long, drawn-out thing, or it could be faster than we can believe when it happens. And there's no way to know it ahead of time. Right. So the, I'm, my motto, my personal motto is uh, I'd rather be a year early than a day late uh, on these <laughs> things, right? And, oh, oh and, absolutely. You need to be there with all of your, your investments in place when something like this happens because you may not have time to adjust when it does. Absolutely. So, so for me, you know, one of the reasons I, I tell people to get physical gold in your possession, not GLD tracking trust or any of that other stuff, um, actual physical gold is because when you analyze it and you look at how much uh, gold is available for investment, that is, it's, it's not monetary gold tucked away in a central bank vault, which is, you know, you can't get to that stuff. So of what's left, compare that to the amount of investment money out there, and it's just minuscule. I mean, these are just, you know, two, two very different sized blobs. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, just recently, the Texas uh, Teachers Pension Fund uh, put a billion dollars into gold. Everybody's like, oh, my gosh, a billion. Uh, I think that plan is managing 80 or 90 billion. So it's, you know, less than 2 percent, you know, percent and a half of their assets. I think if they were going to run a really fully diversified portfolio, they'd have 20 percent of their assets in gold. Right. So, OK, uh, start multiplying that number across all the pension funds and big money that's out there. And you have to come up with a very different price for gold. And by the time that starts happening, I think the average person's ability to get their hands on it will, will be difficult. Not that it'll be impossible. Of course, you know, money, you can always buy something for any price, but it'll, the price will be chasing up so rapidly, people will be psychologically unable to pull the trigger, and eventually it'll be out of reach. That's what I mean by can't get it. Yes, and, and we've seen episodes like that lately. Remember when nobody could get silver coins? They just disappeared for a while? Yes, yes. And, uh, and that, was, uh, you know, that was during the, uh, the not-quite-as-steep 
part of the the upslope in silver prices. It was just there was a supply disruption. You couldn't buy silver coins. Now that same thing could happen with gold and silver because everybody wants gold and silver coins, and premiums go through the roof. And, and yeah, and the coin dealers see coin dealers um, like your corner your corner coin dealer or somebody you might work with online. Um, they have to get their inventory from somewhere, and if the wholesale um, coin dealers are tapped out, then your supply dries up at your local coin dealer, and you literally can't get it. Then, at that point, it doesn't matter how much money you have. There's just no inventory, and, uh, and we could easily see something like that. Yep, yep, that, that's that's the, I, I don't know if it's probable, but it's certainly conceivable, and it's entirely possible, in my mind, that, that such a thing could come to come to pass. So that's why I, I still, and same thing, if, you've, if you have your dreams about um, getting a house and you can do it and make it more resilient, uh, now's a good time uh, to be doing things like that. Because, you know, I'm looking at the way I look at the world, the topic we haven't really touched on yet, but, you know, peak oil is a big thing in my, in my worldview. And, and uh, I'm, all the data is just absolutely scaring me right now because, you know, Saudi Arabia is supposed to be pumping X. Uh, and they can allegedly pump Y, but it turns out they're actually pumping D, you know, just, and they can't explain why, you know, the market's oversaturated. Really? With Brent at 123, are you sure the market's saturated? Um, it, it, there's just crazy stuff going on out there. And I think that, again, you know, perception is everything. And when the perception of where we actually are in this energy story is suddenly okay, for people to recognize on the international stage, we will have a moment, which will be very rapid again, maybe a matter of months, where we will look back on it and go, wow, that was before peak oil recognition on the international stage, and that's after. Before, all these sorts of things were possible, and that was the cost of oil. And after, all these things became impossible, and this is what we had to start doing, and that was the price for oil. And, and so, but these perceptions now can shift really rapidly. It's, it's a, a global game. And I see those as risks that we need to mitigate and uh, in our lives as best we can, because this is going to be an incredible period of adjustment and possibly disruption is how I'm looking at this. Well, what's, what's terrifying about peak oil is that it's really unnecessary to the whole collapse scenario. You know, we're taking on so much debt that even if oil was 10 bucks a barrel, we would still have horrendous financial problems out there. But oil is not 10 bucks a barrel. We, we are, really are running out of the cheap stuff. You know, it's getting harder and harder to get oil, and you have to put more and more energy into the extraction of oil um, so that the price of it is going to go up, other things being equal. And like you said, when that recognition hits, that there, there really isn't as much out there as we thought there was, and its price is going to have to be much higher than it currently is, then, then you get kind of a, a panic scenario in that market that might be the catalyst for pushing us off the cliff. Or it might just grind us down with lower economic growth for year after year because we're paying so much to fill up our gas tanks that there's nothing left over for anything else. So what we have now is a confluence of exponential trends where um, debt is going through the roof and energy is getting harder and harder to get, which is causing the price to go up. And so, um, you know, the perfect storm scenario has, has been tossed around a lot out there. And it, it really is that. You know, there are so many things going wrong at the same time that um, any one of them would be a problem, but you put them all together and you get a disaster. Right. You know, the, the, the working title for my book when I was writing it was Convergence. Um, I, I thought that, that captured it. The publisher wanted to go with the crash course because we got some brand around that and awareness. Um, but Convergence is, is what, where we're at. And so we, I see this Convergent happening over the next five, ten years. We happen to be alive at this moment in time. Keep a journal. It's, it's uh, going to be a spectacular piece of history. There's just so much going on, and, and I'm really glad to have people like you out there analyzing it and helping people figure out what's going on. Because, you know, once you actually add it all up, it's just a lot of this is just logic, um, not to minimize what we do, but it's just logic. When you look at it and you go, hold on a minute, this doesn't, you can't pencil out a solution to this. Therefore, it doesn't have one. Therefore, either we're going to go into a massive debt default or we're going to debase the currency. I mean, there's no option C in this story, right? That's not, it, that, that's just sort of common sense at some point. But Gosh, it's just perilously in short supply uh, in in much of our uh, mainstream analysis out there. So, so thank you for what you what you're doing, and um, uh, I would really encourage people to go to your website. Why don't you tell people where they can go and and what they might find there? Sure, it's uh, www.dollarcollapse.com, and it's a basically a, a blog slash news aggregation site where I post links to uh, to all the articles that uh, that I read every day or that I would read if I had time. And so it's it's designed to be a good place to uh, to go in the morning or in the evening and just uh, 
be caught up with everything that's going on on basically the dark side. You know, all the all the uh, the crazy, dangerous things that are happening out there in the financial markets um, are there. And uh, so, an hour on dollar collapse is the idea is that uh, then you're current with what's happening in the world. Excellent. Dollarcollapse.com. Um, it, it's uh, easy to find. You can find it on our, our blog roll link as well. So, hey, thank you so much for this discussion. It's been great, uh, and I, I hope we can do it again. Thanks, Chris. I'd like that. This concludes this podcast by Chris Martinson. To gain further insight into where things stand today and what might happen tomorrow, please visit chrismartinson.com. That's C H R I S M A R T E N S O N dot com. Please join Chris Martinson next time to continue your journey toward awareness, understanding, and action.